Have you ever come across adorable children operating lemonade stands near their homes, complete with charming little stalls and amusing signs? Often, these young entrepreneurs aim to raise funds for personal goals, like buying a purebred kitten, the latest video game, a bicycle, or even a trip to Disneyland. It's easy to assume they're simply engaging in a fun activity, but the reality can be far more profound. In today's video, we dive into the stories of 10 remarkable children who chose to sell lemonade for a cause far greater than personal gain. Surprisingly, these young vendors sometimes face legal challenges due to lacking the necessary permits or business licenses to sell food and beverages roadside, placing them at odds with the law. Take, for example, the story of a nine-year-old girl who set up her lemonade stand on South Coral Street. Seated in a lawn chair at her driveway's end, she used two metallic TV tables for her setup, one of which displayed a homemade sign on lined paper. Reagan Milton was not just selling lemonade for 50 cents and face painting for a dollar out of whim, her goal was to support the June E. Nillen Cancer Center. Reagan, aware of the summer heat and the popularity of lemonade stands, decided to contribute her earnings to the cancer center, stating, I didn't need the money, so I wanted to give it to the cancer center. Starting with an initial donation of $50, she ambitiously set a new target to raise $1,000. I know I can do that, she confidently asserted. Since May, after completing third grade at Washington Elementary School, Reagan has expanded her offerings to include cookies, rainbow loom bracelets, and face painting. Her mother, Amy Nelson, shared, this was all her idea. I just make the lemonade and cookies. Operating the stand about twice a week outside their home, Reagan has cultivated a base of regular customers and received generous donations from her community. These inspiring tales of young philanthropists remind us that even the simplest acts, like selling lemonade, can hold profound significance and impact lives in unexpected ways. On a Wednesday afternoon, six-year-old Sophie Amon and 12-year-old Sadie Robbins visited to purchase drinks worth a dollar. Earlier, a different neighbor had given $20 for just one cup. Anyone interested in setting up their own stand can use a comprehensive guide provided by Country Time Lemonade, which offers advice, recipes, and fundamental business principles, along with innovative marketing strategies. To further incentivize participation, Country Time initiated the Fantastic Lemonade Stantacular contest, urging families to construct the most impressive stand in their area. Additionally, through a connected social media campaign, individuals are encouraged to share pictures of their lemonade stands with the hashtags hashtag CountryTime, hashtag Fantastic, and hashtag Lemonade. For every photo shared on platforms like Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, Country Time pledges to donate $5, up to a total of $50,000, to Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. This foundation was established in memory of Alexandra Scott, an eight-year-old girl who aspired to raise a million dollars for childhood cancer research before succumbing to neuroblastoma. Her foundation has since garnered over $80 million. Reagan and her mother have chosen to direct their fundraising efforts locally, contributing to the broader mission of raising cancer awareness and funds. Through her experience, Reagan is learning the value of patience, perseverance, and grace. She understands that achieving goals requires dedication and time. To expand her reach, she plans to create a mobile wooden booth to travel around Sioux City. Her mother, Nelson, believes firmly in her daughter's ambition, confident that she will achieve her significant goal. In this country, police presence does not incite fear. In one instance, an officer not only refrained from reprimanding a girl for unauthorized selling or obstructing the road but also supported her by purchasing lemonade. This reflects a broader perspective on law enforcement, highlighting the dual role police play in community support and law enforcement. Not everyone feels secure around officers, which underscores the importance of community policing. Through regular interaction with community members, Beyond emergency situations or crises, officers can foster stronger relationships and understanding, enhancing the overall sense of safety and trust within the community. This heartwarming tale from Lake County, Ohio, highlights the profound impact a simple act of kindness can have, demonstrating the power of community and trust between citizens and police. 
It begins with a young girl named Gabrielle, who dreams of owning an iPad for schoolwork and games. When her mother, Melissa, explains they can't afford it, Gabrielle's entrepreneurial spirit kicks in. She decides to set up a lemonade stand to earn the money herself, learning the value of hard work in the process. Living in a rural area posed a challenge for foot traffic, but Gabrielle's grandmother offered a solution with her bustling condo complex. Armed with enthusiasm and a fresh batch of lemonade, Gabrielle's business venture quickly took off. Among her first customers was a local police officer who not only paid well above the asking price but also spread the word among his colleagues. Moved by Gabrielle's determination, the officer visited a local store to rally support for her cause. The community's response was heartening, and soon, he was able to present Gabrielle with a brand new iPad. The joyous moment was captured in a photo shared by Melissa on Facebook, which swiftly captured the hearts of thousands online, garnering over 34,000 shares. Despite the widespread attention and calls for interviews, the officer, identified as Ropos, humbly declined the spotlight. His primary intention was never fame but to bring a smile to a young girl's face. This story is a beautiful reminder of the difference one person's kindness can make, reinforcing the bond between law enforcement and the community they serve. After watching this story, what do you think of? Then there is an another story about traffic stops. Let's expect what will happen. In 2018, New Jersey State Trooper Michael Patterson was conducting routine traffic stops on the highway. He anticipated a typical day on the job, enforcing traffic laws and possibly issuing some citations. Patterson had chosen a career in law enforcement due to a significant incident from his past and held a deep respect for the profession. Little did he know, a seemingly ordinary traffic stop on June 1, 2018, would lead to an astounding revelation about his own history and the identity of the driver he was about to encounter. On this particularly warm summer day, Trooper Patterson had been busy dealing with standard traffic violations. As the day progressed, it seemed it would be business as usual until he noticed a white BMW on the Kingswood Township Highway. Patterson quickly identified an issue with the vehicle, but it wasn't for speeding or reckless driving, it was something he encountered less frequently. The white BMW caught Patterson's attention due to its excessively tinted windows. The tint was so dark that it was nearly impossible to see who was inside the vehicle, including the front windows, which was a clear violation of New Jersey's regulations on window tinting. Determined to address the violation, Patterson activated the lights on his patrol car and initiated a traffic stop. As the 26-year-old officer exited his vehicle and approached the BMW, he had no idea that this routine stop would unveil a remarkable connection between him and the driver, transforming an ordinary day into an unforgettable moment. Officer Patterson made it a point to activate his body camera, a decision that led to the video spreading widely online. He had conducted numerous traffic stops in his career, viewing them as routine, yet he was aware that each encounter could be unique and potentially unpredictable. This traffic stop, however, was about to become anything but ordinary. Upon approaching the vehicle, Patterson encountered a man in his middle years at the wheel. Following standard procedure, he inquired, Sir, do you know why I've pulled you over today? The driver expressed uncertainty about the reason for the stop, prompting Patterson to clarify that the issue was the car's window tints, which violated New Jersey regulations. The man behind the wheel was somewhat mortified, especially given his identity. The driver then revealed his background to Patterson, explaining his discomfort with the situation. He was a retired police officer from New Jersey, having served the law in the state for three decades. Introducing himself as Matthew, he shared his fondness for his former career and his decision to retire in pursuit of a different life path, though he hadn't anticipated the peculiar twist their conversation would take. Attempting to leverage their shared law enforcement background, Matthew hoped the connection might spare him a ticket. He apologized for the oversight regarding his window tints, explaining they were a recent addition from a local auto shop and he had mistakenly believed they complied with legal standards. He committed to rectifying the issue. However, as they delved into further conversation, it became clear their interaction was evolving into much more than a simple traffic stop discussion. 
A retired police officer from New Jersey found the conversation a pleasant diversion from his otherwise dull day. As they conversed, driver Matthew shared that he lived nearby but worked as a police officer in a region over 40 miles away. As Patterson listened, he became increasingly interested in his new acquaintance, sensing that this was no ordinary interaction. As their conversation unfolded, revealing their backgrounds, experiences in law enforcement, and personal lives, they found common ground. In the midst of their discussion, they began to exchange tales of the high-stakes situations they had encountered in their careers. It was then that Matthew felt compelled to share a particularly memorable event from his time on duty in Piscataway, New Jersey, where he had previously patrolled. This revelation caught Patterson's attention, especially since he was born and raised in Piscataway and often visited his family there. As Matthew delved into the story of a remarkable night from his past, Patterson listened with keen interest. Matthew recounted a night, early in his career, when he responded to an urgent call. He was patrolling solo in Piscataway, much like Patterson was at the time of their meeting. The call concerned a pregnant woman who, after grocery shopping with her son, realized something was amiss with her health. Despite not knowing the specifics, she sensed the urgency to get home quickly. After returning from the supermarket, the woman quickly informed her husband that she felt their baby might arrive sooner than anticipated. She hadn't expected labor to start so suddenly. By the time she got home, it was clear that the baby was on its way, prompting her husband to seek immediate assistance. Unlike typical labor stories that span several hours, this one was unfolding at an astonishing pace. According to Matthew, the expectant mother was already in the throes of labor by the time her husband contacted the authorities. Realizing that a hospital visit was out of the question due to the intense pain, she prepared for childbirth in her bedroom, feeling a mix of fear and anticipation as she awaited the arrival of the police. Officer Matthew, who was on duty at the time, responded to the call with urgency, his vehicle's sirens and lights alerting the neighborhood to the emergency. Although he had received some training for such scenarios, nothing could have fully prepared him for this moment. At that time, I had no children of my own, Matthew later shared with CBS Morning, reflecting on his attempt to draw upon his training. Upon reaching the scene, he found the woman in the midst of severe contractions, and it was clear that the birth would happen right there in her bedroom. With no time to play the expert, Matthew sought guidance from the woman's doctor over the phone. He, alongside her husband, followed the doctor's instructions closely. The tension was palpable as they navigated through this extraordinary situation, which ultimately led to the woman giving birth to a healthy baby boy. For Matthew, it was an unforgettable and profoundly moving experience, marking one of the most incredible moments of his life. This tale, as recounted by Matthew, wasn't new to those who had heard it before, given its remarkable nature. It stood out as one of the most extraordinary events he had ever been a part of. During his tenure as a police officer, he often reminisced about two significant events, the time he assisted in delivering a baby in a woman's bedroom. As Matthew recounted this particular incident, it was clear this retelling was distinct, not because his audience was another police officer, but due to Officer Michael Patterson's extraordinary reaction. As Matthew wrapped up his tale, he noticed something different in Patterson's demeanor and awaited his reply, unsure of what to expect. What happened next was beyond his imagination. Officer Patterson began to inquire further, which was unusual. Generally, when Matthew shared his tale, people would marvel at the uniqueness of the situation or commend Matthew for his courage. Most found the story unbelievable and bombarded him with questions. However, the questions from Officer Patterson were peculiar and unexpected. Initially, Officer Patterson sought to know the precise date of the event. Then, he inquired about the street name where it all occurred. Matthew presumed Patterson's curiosity stemmed from being familiar with Piscataway, the town it happened in. However, he was soon to discover his assumption was incorrect. Matthew vividly remembered every detail of that day, the first and only time he had delivered a baby, making every memory indelible. He informed Patterson that the event took place on the night of October 5, 1991, 26 years before their roadside encounter. 
Upon being asked about the location, Matthew mentioned it occurred on Poe Place, a street name he could never forget due to that night's events. Officer Patterson, the New Jersey cop standing before him, had his reasons for remembering Poe Place too, but they were entirely different. With one last question, as Matthew provided all the details he could recall, Officer Patterson stood agape next to the car, astounded by the narrative unfolding from the man in the driver's seat. Patterson was overwhelmed, his mind reeling with the implications of what he was hearing. He had one final question, driven by a need to confirm his burgeoning suspicion, trying his best not to seem odd. The retired officer posed one final question to Matthew, the name of the woman who had given birth in her bedroom that fateful night. Matthew's memory of that event was crystal clear. He not only shared the woman's name, Karen, but also vividly described the area of Poe Place, the color and style of the house where the baby was delivered, and even remembered the baby's name, Michael. Michael Patterson was stunned by what he heard. Every year on his birthday, his mother would recount the story of his unusual birth, including the grocery shopping, the at-home delivery, and the officer who assisted. Now, in an incredible twist of fate, he was face to face with that very same officer. That was me, Michael exclaimed to Matthew. Both men were astounded by the coincidence. They laughed, shook hands, and marveled at the unbelievable turn of events. Thanks to Patterson's body camera, there was footage of their encounter, ensuring that their story wouldn't be dismissed as mere coincidence. As Matthew let him off without a ticket, Michael couldn't shake a lingering regret, he hadn't exchanged contact information or taken a photo with the officer who had delivered him. But then, Michael remembered a crucial detail. Before parting ways, the officer had recorded Matthew's driver's license information. Using this, Michael located Matthew's address, which happened to be nearby. With a sense of determination, Michael penned a letter to the man who had played a pivotal role in his life, suggesting they meet again. At times, the highway trooper felt hopeful but uncertain about what lay ahead. When the opportunity for a reunion arose, Matthew eagerly seized it. Now a grown man, he had been delivered as a baby by the trooper. Patterson, along with his mother, visited Matthew's home to meet him and his wife, marking a tear-filled reunion 26 years in the making. Together, they reminisced about the wild evening on Poe Place. The New Jersey State Police shared pictures of the reunion, along with a video of their chance encounter captured on Michael's body cam. The story swiftly went viral, with many amazed by the serendipitous meeting years later. Michael's mother was moved to tears recalling the night and the officer who had helped save her child. But the reunion held even more in store. A bond had formed since birth, and according to Matthew, Michael Patterson, and his mother, this reunion was just the beginning. They vowed to stay in touch, recognizing the special connection they shared. Matthew believed that a greater power orchestrated their meeting and was open to the journey ahead. In another pivotal moment, a North Carolina woman received a life-altering call while driving to work, her house was on fire. As she hurried back home, she encountered Officer Jesse Freeman of the Maiden Police Department. Letitia Elmore, a single mother of four, was initially stopped by Officer Freeman for speeding, but she believes it was divine intervention that placed him in her path at that crucial moment. She explained to the officer that she had received a distressing call about her house being on fire. To compound her worry, Elmore didn't even have her license with her at the time. I just knew it was over for me, she recounted to WSOC. I'm like, they're not going to believe me. They'll probably think I'm making something up to avoid going to jail. However, Officer Freeman reacted differently. He empathized with Elmore, having experienced the devastation of losing everything in a house fire himself. Freeman's childhood home had been lost to a fire just before the holidays, and his sergeant had also faced a similar tragedy the previous year. Offering his support, Freeman offered to drive Elmore home and kept her calm as she braced for the worst. I could just see in her eyes that something just wasn't right, Freeman recalled. Though Elmore lost everything in the fire, she expressed gratitude for Freeman's assistance, saying he reassured her that everything would be okay. She remarked that if more police officers were like him, the world would be a better place. Recently, 
Elmore and Freeman reunited, embracing each other with a hug. Elmore emphasized that Freeman's small act of empathy would always stay with her. In a separate incident, Deputy Robert Pounds had an unexpected encounter during a routine traffic stop in Naples, Florida. Pulling over Wilfred Jean Lewis and his wife Fabron Gorgeous, Deputy Pounds realized that Fabron was in labor and needed urgent assistance. The Collier County Sheriff's Office shared the surprising turn of events on Facebook, highlighting how deputies are often faced with unexpected situations on duty. Approaching the car, Deputy Pounds swiftly discerned that the passenger was in the midst of labor. Wilfred promptly disclosed the urgency of the situation, admitting to his speeding. Officer, you have every right to pull me over. I won't deny it, he explained during a conversation captured on Deputy Pound's dashcam. We're rushing because the baby is on her way. Initially skeptical, the deputy's doubts dissipated when he saw the baby's head starting to emerge. Calling for assistance and an ambulance, Deputy Pounds assisted in the delivery of a precious baby girl using just a sterile blanket and a pair of latex gloves. I spread out the blanket, and before long, I was cradling a newborn in my hands, he recounted. It was like my training kicked in naturally. The baby did most of the work, to be honest. Despite outward composure, Deputy Pounds admitted to feeling a surge of apprehension internally, given the unprecedented nature of the situation after 26 years on the force. Being a father himself, he found comfort in the baby's firm grip on his finger, a reassuring sign of her vitality. Even though I appeared calm, inside, I was probably more nervous than I let on, Deputy Pounds confessed. But my training, along with the agencies, guided me through it admirably. Wilfred and Fabian decided to honor the officer in a touching manner by naming their newborn baby girl Lila Robert John Louis after him. It just felt right, Wilfred explained. He was there for us when we needed help, doing what I couldn't do myself. In a heartwarming turn of events, the new parents found themselves exempt from receiving a traffic ticket after all. Here's to the joyous couple. While encounters with law enforcement can vary, it's crucial to remember your rights and responsibilities. You're entitled to receive a citation for any violation, but failure to provide identification or registration is not an option. Additionally, complying with legitimate instructions, such as exiting the vehicle or consenting to searches, is required. Maintaining politeness and cooperation, even with simple affirmatives like, yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, can go a long way. Remaining silent may result in a ticket being issued, and appearing disheveled or uncooperative might prompt further scrutiny, including field sobriety tests. While you have the right to refuse, consider the potential consequences and whether prolonged confrontation is worthwhile. In the end, the officer may return to your vehicle, issue the ticket, and depart without exchanging words. Both parties may choose to maintain silence, allowing the encounter to conclude peacefully. After watching this story, what do you think of? Then there is an another story about a stranger police officer. Let's expect what will happen. A stranger tosses a mysterious box near Cobb, who notices and commands him to halt on the spot. A police officer decides to shield a homeless man he was supposed to arrest and is unexpectedly rewarded with a small box. Tom Jones, an unusual figure, used to be homeless and would often loiter near St. Benedict, a school reserved for affluent children. He believed he had a better chance of receiving genuine favors from the wealthy kids. However, he was mistaken. Despite his kind nature, his ragged appearance offended the sensibilities of the wealthy, who despised him. The children, following their lead, regularly mocked and teased him, knowing he couldn't retaliate due to his frailty. One afternoon after school, a group of children led by a boy named Ken found Tom. They began taunting him, but Tom remained impassive, repeating a mantra in his mind, hoping they'd leave. When they didn't, the insults escalated into something more sinister. In a fit of rage and to impress his peers, Ken approached Tom and delivered a forceful kick to his leg while the other children recorded the incident on their phones. Tom, unable to endure any more kicks, stood up and gently pushed the young boy away. However, the boy dramatically feigned injury, crying out that Tom had tried to kill him. 
He pushed me. He was trying to kill me just now. The boy yelled to his friends. Do you know what my dad will do to you? Tom, sensing trouble, began gathering his belongings to avoid further confrontation with angry parents. Ken called his parents, who quickly mobilized other concerned parents. Within minutes, the school grounds were swarming with worried adults, surrounding the composed Tom and demanding an explanation for his actions. Your son started this when he tried to pick on me, Tom calmly asserted. You should apologize for laying your filthy hands on my son, Ken's father retorted angrily. Infuriated, Tom refused to back down. Ken's father, unable to resolve the situation, called the police for assistance. Officer Jeffrey, a young cop eager to prove himself, arrived at the scene. Tom introduced himself and recounted the incident to Jeffrey, showing him the video evidence. He hoped the officer would intervene and resolve the matter fairly. The kids adamantly denied Tom's account, backed by their parents who questioned if the homeless man would sue. Growing weary of the argument, Jeffrey surveyed the area and discovered another CCTV camera on the street. Retrieving its footage, he watched the incident unfold. Enraged by what he saw, Jeffrey rebuked the parents for indulging their spoiled children. You feast on expensive food without a care, oblivious to the world around you, he scolded. He's a person, just like you, albeit enduring a life of poverty. How did you raise your children to kick a man while he's down? Warning them of consequences if any child dared touch Tom again, Jeffrey asserted his authority. After some murmurs of agreement, the parents dispersed, taking their children with them, leaving Tom alone with Jeffrey. You're a real cop, just like my father was, Tom remarked suddenly. Surprised, Jeffrey inquired about Tom's father. Tom proudly spoke of his father's honesty and the respect he commanded. He shared that his father passed away when he was young, leaving him a small cafe that eventually fell victim to crisis, leading to his own struggles. I'm sorry to hear that, Jeffrey responded sympathetically. Tom then presented Jeffrey with a small box from his rucksack, containing his father's police badge. It's all I have left of him, and I want you to have it, Tom said gratefully. Moved by the gesture, Jeffrey accepted the box, thanking Tom for his gratitude. Later, in his patrol vehicle, Jeffrey opened the box to find the police badge with Captain Harold Jones engraved on the back. News of Jeffrey's encounter with the affluent crowd spread quickly, but the altercation, having occurred in public, garnered positive attention. Jeffrey earned newfound respect, having stood up for Tom and giving the wealthy a piece of his mind. The next day, Tom was perched at his usual spot when he drifted off to sleep. Uninterrupted, he slipped into a deeper slumber. Upon awakening, he found a medium-sized box beside him. Opening it, he discovered a pair of brand new, warm shoes accompanied by a note. I'll become a police captain, and I promise I'll be just like your father was, so that my son can be proud of me as you are proud of your father, the note read. Tom immediately knew who the gift was from, and he smiled. Bullying should never be tolerated, Jeffrey was right to admonish the affluent individuals who sought to punish Tom rather than their own children for instigating the conflict. By speaking his mind, Jeffrey earned the respect of his peers. Gratitude, Tom realized, was significant. He hadn't expected anyone to come to his aid, but Jeffrey stood up for him. In return, the homeless man gave the young officer a meaningful gift, fueling his drive to become a captain. In another incident, a black boy from Georgia found himself facing police scrutiny after being seen in a neighborhood where he wasn't welcome. When a white police officer responded to the call, the outcome surprised many on social media. A recent post on the City of Hateful Police's social media page featured a brief Facebook clip showing the young black boy embracing a police officer after being shown something in the trunk of the officer's car. The boy's encounter with the Georgia police stemmed from a call made to remove him from the neighborhood. It remained unclear whether the community was aware of the boy's identity or why he was there before contacting the authorities. In a departure from many stories involving police and black individuals, this particular incident ended positively. When Officer Colrain responded to a call about a boy loitering in a neighborhood, 
he discovered a heartwarming reason behind the boy's presence. The unnamed juvenile explained that he was in the area to offer his services for yard work, mowing lawns, pulling weeds, and trimming hedges, to earn money for a PlayStation. What struck Officer Colrain was the boy's politeness, respectfulness, and honesty. Impressed by the boy's demeanor and his own affinity for gaming, Officer Colrain rallied some friends to help fulfill the child's wish. In a Facebook video, Officer Colrain surprises the boy by revealing a PlayStation box in the trunk of his vehicle. Overwhelmed with joy, the boy covers his face with his hands before embracing the officer in a warm hug of gratitude. Additionally, Officer Colrain promises the delighted child that they will play together online someday, further demonstrating his kindness. Social media users were touched by Officer Colrain's gesture, praising his compassion and the boy's admirable work ethic. Despite the negativity surrounding the initial call to the police, the boy's determination to earn what he desired through hard work overshadowed any negative sentiments. Followers on platforms like Facebook and Coke Fox 25 News Oklahoma's post commended Officer Colrain's actions, with some expressing disappointment in the neighbors who had called the police on the industrious youngster. Netizens lauded the boy for his determination to work for what he wanted, praising his parents for instilling responsibility in him. Similarly, Officer Colrain received praise for his kindness, with one commenter expressing willingness to let the boy mow their lawn out of admiration for his work ethic. Another commenter expressed love for the post, condemning the neighbor's negativity and highlighting how the boy's commitment to hard work overshadowed any negative sentiments. Appreciation for the boy's hustle and gratitude towards his supportive parents and Officer Colrain for recognizing the value of his efforts were also expressed. In a less heartwarming story, a pair of Florida sheriff's deputies faced investigation for arresting a legally blind man after mistaking his folded cane for a firearm. James Hodges, 61, was detained by Columbia County Sheriff's Office deputies on October 31 as he walked home from the courthouse. In body cam footage, a female deputy questions Hodges about the item in his back pocket, mistaking it for a weapon. Hodges clarifies that it's a navigational aid but refuses to provide his name and date of birth, arguing that the deputy lacks reasonable cause to request such information. Chat GPT. Do you want me to put you in handcuffs right now? The deputy asks. What is your suspicion? Hodges questions. It looks like you were carrying a gun in your back pocket. I'm stopping to make sure you're carrying it properly, the deputy responds. Hodges then pulls out his cane to show it to the other deputy, who acknowledges that it could resemble a gun. Her suspicion was that you were armed, the deputy states. But now she's verified that I'm not armed, Hodges asserts, refusing to present his ID. Subsequently, the deputies place him in handcuffs and appear to retrieve his driver's license from his pocket. When asked if he's legally blind, Hodges confirms and explains that his jury duty was cancelled. Why aren't you using your stick? You don't have to use your stick all the time, a deputy questions. Not all the time, Hodges replies, requesting the female deputy's badge number. You know what, put him in jail for resisting, an officer is heard saying. Following the incident, Hodges was charged with resisting arrest without violence. The Columbia County Sheriff's Office expressed concern over the video footage and initiated an administrative investigation. The statement assured that appropriate action would be taken if policy violations were found. Hodges received community support after the incident and emphasized the importance of remaining calm and saying as little as possible during interactions with law enforcement. If misconduct occurs, contacting a civil rights attorney after the encounter is advised. Additionally, escalating a police encounter by arguing with officers is discouraged, as many individuals may not fully understand the law, including some attorneys whose expertise lies in civil cases rather than criminal law.